Hello everyone. Um, and a very good day or evening, um, uh, based on where you're tuning from. Uh, I'm Divya Mohan, and today I'm going to be speaking about Cube Warden, which is a project, um, to simplify policy as code, as also improve, um, uh, you know, the code reusability, and our uh, developer experience, um, uh, while doing so. So, before I go ahead. Um, I would like to take a quick couple of minutes to introduce myself. I'm Divya Mohan, and I work as a senior technical evangelist at SUSO. I am also one of the documentation uh, maintainers on the Kubernetes project and a CNCF ambassador. Um, I have uh, co-created the KCNA exam, which basically um helps people who are getting into the cloud native ecosystem test their knowledge of um everything of all the basics in the cloud native uh, world now um coming to the agenda for today i um i foresee a very packed schedule so first up we're going to look at uh Cube Warden, what exactly it is, what's the architecture, delve a little deep, um, then look at why it came into existence despite um, all the admission control and security um, policies that we have uh, uh, built in into Kubernetes. We'll uh, try, you know, uh, demoing that and um, we'll also see um, some of the cool new stuff that's been released as part of Cube Warden version 1.3, which is our latest and last major release uh, for this year. And we'll also try seeing it with a demo uh, and hope that, you know, all the demo gods comply today. Now, um, if you want to actually follow along on the presentation or uh, follow along with the presentation or, you know, you want a reference um, for later to actually, you know, check out, um, you can visit the uh, link that's visible on your screens right now. And uh, although the uh, screen cap doesn't show the screen deck, uh, not screen deck, sorry, slide deck, um that's included in it as well so you are uh, going to have all the code that i am executing right now on my machine um the environment that i'm using and uh, you know the slide deck for ready reference later on as well so with that psa out of the way let's look at what is cube warden um now i now, I would like to first, you know, start off with the textbook definition, which is a policy engine for Kubernetes to simplify the policy code process. Um, it's also a CNCF project. Oops, sorry. It's a CNCF project. Um, and we are in the CNCF sandbox um, as of uh, June this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, if you actually want to see us on the CNCF landscape, I am afraid that, um, you know, given the size of the landscape, I was not able to uh, give you a like for like representation here. Uh, but I have circled it in black, if you can see, and you'll be able to view Cube Warden under the security and compliance section of the landscape. And the logo that you need to be looking out for is this. So um, you can go check it out at landscape.cncf.io to know more details about the project in terms of, you know, stars, etc. Or you can visit our GitHub repo as well, uh, which is https github.com slash cubeboard. Now, um, this is all great. But what exactly is so special about Cube Warden and why was it required despite all the um, built-in admission control um, and security that we have within Kubernetes? What's the secret sauce? Um, so first, we'll address this in two parts. Let me, you know, uh, state that at the outset. Uh, we um, have... Um, you know, when we started off with um, um, 
Kubernetes, uh, we had port security policies to enforce, um, uh, you know, securities, uh, security for access control uh, based on permissions. Uh, now we know, um, and we shall see in the next couple of slides that uh, there were some drawbacks of uh, with this approach, which is why we sort of deprecated, then removed um, and provided an alternative in the form of pod security admission. Uh, pod security admission is a great replacement, uh, but it might not uh, give you the power to enforce the level of granularity that you'd like. So um, that's why we... Um, see a lot of tools that are recommended as supplements. Uh, Cube Warden aims to be one of them, uh, but let's see how it stands out because there are other cloud native tools in this space, right? Like there's OPA, there's Gatekeeper. Um, why not choose them? Uh, they are more matured in terms of, you know, the number of uh, um, years maybe in existence. So, um, for anyone who's actually used uh, OPA and Gatekeeper, uh, you know the steep learning curve that actually comes um, along with learning that tool, right? You have to learn a separate language in the form of Rego from scratch to actually start enforcing your policies or writing policies rather. So um, what if I told you that you could write your... Kubernetes policies in a programming language of your choice. Um, doesn't that sound cool? Um, that's, again, one of the aims um, of Cube Warden to allow developers to actually write uh, policies in a language that you choose. Now, um, there's a caveat. Uh, of course, there's a caveat because, you know, all good things come with caveats. So um, what's the caveat? The language that you use needs to compile to WebAssembly bindings. Uh, now, WebAssembly is, a, a, you know, is a landscape that's growing pretty quickly. Um, so we have a lot of languages that are, you know, fulfilling this caveat um, currently, but uh, not all of them are supported by CubeWarden because um, like I said, uh, we are relatively younger in the landscape as compared to some of the other tools. And uh, keeping up is difficult. Uh, although we are trying our best to actually bridge that gap to improve uh, your experience. So what are the languages, uh, you know, that we support currently? Now, when I first said WebAssembly, I'm sure you thought Rust. Like... It's very synonymous. Uh, Rust and WebAssembly go hand in hand for some reason in everyone else's mind um, and in my mind too. So um, it was a no-brainer for us at the Cubeboarden project to actually, um, you know, empower you to write policies in Rust should you choose to. Uh, so we've gotten uh, uh, around to creating a... Uh, SDK that's Rust based, leveraging the official Rust compiler so that uh, WebAssembly uh, policies can be generated as WebAssembly modules and, you know, then subsequently evaluated uh, during incoming requests. Um, but Rust is not everyone's cup of tea. Um, it's considered niche. I don't know how true that is, but it's considered niche. So uh, what are the other options that we offer? So the second option is Go. Um, now, Go is pretty popular in the cloud native ecosystem, but it is not a first class um, citizen in the WebAssembly one. Um, that's uh, kind of reflecting in the fact that Go uh, does not have its official compiler supporting WebAssembly which is why we have used the TinyGo compiler um, that actually generates WebAssembly modules um, from, you know, Go code. And uh, we have a project policy template, for, sorry, we have a policy um, template for you to actually get started uh, in case you want to 
you know, begin writing policies right off the uh, right after this presentation. So all of that is linked in the resources section of this presentation. And um, uh, it's there for all of the languages, by the way, if I did not say that before. Um, the next one up uh, is Swift. Now, um, I don't know how widely used it is, so uh, pardon me because I do not come from a development background. Uh, but if, um, you know, your choice of poison or your poison of choice uh, is uh, Swift, we have an SDK for that too. Um, leveraging not the Swift compiler because it's still official Swift compiler because it still doesn't support uh, WebAssembly yet. Um, but we use the Swift version project. Um, so these are broadly uh, the three languages uh, that we support. And I know I started off with an ambitious claim of, uh, you know, saying that users can write Kubernetes policies in their favorite programming languages. And that is the aim. Um, there, uh, you know, we have plans of, you know, being inclusive of front-end development folks as well by incorporating um, assembly script, which is like a very strict um, subsection of, not subsection, which is a strict subset of uh, TypeScript, which is a strict subset of JavaScript. So we haven't forgotten y'all, but like I said, the WebAssembly landscape is one that's quickly growing. Um, and um, as it grows, we, and as you know, more and more languages uh, have their official compilers support, um, um, support the WebAssembly, um, uh, you know, spec, we will be able to uh, have, you know, specific SDKs for that as well. But currently, these are the only three. But um, I spoke a lot about reusability as well. In fact, I think I mentioned it twice uh, as of now. And um, why did I speak of that? And what's the deal with it? Now, if you've been in this space, you probably are using OP or Gatekeeper. Um, and for all the, um, you know, things that I said about a steep learning curve, people have actually adopted it. It's there for a reason. So um, what if you actually want to switch to, uh, you know, cube model? Uh, or, you know, you want to at least try out cube model. Uh, do you have to learn any of the programming languages that I said in the previous slide? Not really. Uh, I mean, you probably could if you want to, but you can also reuse almost all your existing Rego policies. I say almost because um, some policies um, have, um, not some policies, um, policies have uh, built-in functions and some of these functions are SDK dependent which means that Cubeborden has to actually implement them as opposed to the WebAssembly file, uh, um, you know, as opposed to it actually getting implemented in the WebAssembly file. Um, now, we have made it a point to actually cater to a majority of um, the k users by um, offering support for almost all of the built-in functions, but we realize that it does not cover all the bases and we are tracking um, this over a GitHub issue. If this is something of interest to you, you should also chime in on that thread. I've included it in the resources section of the slide and um, you can help prioritize the work that's being done in this regard. And once you actually write these policies, how do you share them? Where do you store them? Uh, what do you store them as? Uh, like you could have them on your local machine, sure. But what if you actually want to, you know, help others use the same thing? What if you've written a damn good policy? Um, so um, you could use a web server, not saying no. But isn't it kind of, uh, you know, uh, tedious to do that? So the cube warden project actually allows you to publish the policies as 
OCI artifacts and obviously store them as the art as OCI artifacts in um, an OCI compliant registry. Docker Hub is currently not supported because it's not OCI compliant, but I hear that's in the works too in like the coming few months uh, in the sense that it will become OCI compliant. So um, when you ask me what is the secret sauce, I'd probably summarize it as Kubernetes dynamic admission control and um, WebAssembly. And um, now that we've looked a bit at the WebAssembly side of it, let's look at, you know, the dy dynamic admission control part of it, right? Um, so we'll be now moving into the architecture section wherein I'm going to first, you know, speak to the architecture diagram, rather speak from the architecture diagram um, and, um, you know, describe all the components. And then we'll see how they interlink. Um, with the help of a sample request flow. Sounds good? Right. Um, so this is the architecture diagram and I know it looks intimidating, but I promise you it's not. Uh, so we've been talking about policies all this while. Uh, it's a policy engine. We are talking about policy as code. Um, we're talking about evaluation of policies. So policy is kind of a big deal in this presentation and it's also the star so um in the context of cube warden um policies are web assembly modules as you've probably guessed by now or at least heard from the previous couple of slides um now when you have these policies you need something to actually enforce them and evaluate the requests against these policies right so that's what the cubeboard and policy server is for, which is our next component. Um, and when uh, we talk about, um, you know, the uh, when we actually talk about cubeboard, uh, we obviously are going to have some um, custom resources that are specific or some natives that are specific to uh, CubeWord. They're known as CubeWord and custom resources. Very similar to uh, Kubernetes custom resources that help us effectively manage the process of, uh, you know, evaluating policies. And, uh, last but not the least, it's the thread that holds all of it together, uh, the CubeWord and controller. Now, uh, the cube warden controller is kind of like the eldest child in the family. It's gotten a lot of responsibilities. That's pretty much everything. <laughs> Sorry, that's pretty much everything here, like in the background. So first up, it's responsible for creation of, uh, you know, some of the components of the stack. It's also responsible um, for ensuring that Kubernetes understands cube warden. Because Kubernetes, um, like I said, uh, there are going to be some constructs in Kubernetes. There are constructs in Kubernetes. Somebody has to make sure that, um, you know, uh, Kubernetes uh, is able to communicate with Kubernetes so that it can ev uh, evaluate resources. Um, Kube, uh, the controller does the job of actually uh, translating uh cube warden constructs into kubernetes natives and it also does um you know this whole thing of uh, reconciliation of uh, uh policies now what it is and how it happens is something we shall actually look at in the next section which is about the request flow but um once, uh, you know, CubeWarden is created, uh, Kubernetes needs to know that it exists, right? Like, sure, you actually are installing it atop, sorry, atop Kubernetes, uh, but you need to know, uh, like, one needs to know of the other for it to work seamlessly. The CubeWarden controller does that as well. Uh, so um, how does it do that? Uh, it's... Uh, how does it achieve this whole process is we are the concept of dynamic admission control, wherein cube warden 
is an ad admission webhook. It essentially functions as an admission webhook with its endpoint being the Cubeboard and Policy Server. Now, how does this whole process happen? Again, sample request flow. And that's how, you know, Kubernetes ties, or rather Cubeboard ties into the whole Kubernetes install. So if this sounds like mumbo jumbo, um, or, you know, a bunch of um, rambles, just bear with me, please, because we are now going into the request flow part of it, wherein we look at, um, you know, how uh, Cubeborden actually gets to the point of evaluating uh, incoming requests by integrating with Kubernetes API server, right? So uh, first up, when uh, Cubeborden is installed freshly, uh, what happens is that it um, only installs two components. One is uh, the Cubeboard and controller deployment, and the other is um, a policy server custom resource named default. Now, when the controller notices that there is a policy server uh, custom resource, it uh, obviously spins up. Um, uh, it obviously spins up a deployment. Now, uh, I told you uh, a while back that it is the, sorry, the policy server is the uh, webhook as well. And, um, you know, by design, the webhook, uh, webhooks within, webhook endpoints within Kubernetes are uh, required to have um, some sort of security enforced in the form of uh, TLS. Um, so, uh, what the Cubeboard and controller does is also take on the onus of securing this endpoint by generating self-signed CA certificates and ensuring that the associated TLS certificate and keys are in order and then exposes it to the network via a cluster IP service. But now we write our very first policy that is uh, we use the cluster admission policy resource and uh, write in as many policies as we want. Um, now, within this resource, you can specify as many, like I said. And I said, uh, uh, but I also said that there's a whole reconciliation process. What's that about? Now, when the cubeboard and controller notices that there is a cluster admission policy resource. Uh, what happens is that uh, there is a reconciliation loop triggered in which the um, config map generation is actually initiated. Now, what's a config map? A config map is basically a Kubernetes API that stores, um, you know, environment specific configuration. Um, so that your container image actually doesn't have to do that. It becomes portable. Um, but when this, uh, you know, config map is created, uh, your controller actually uh, uses it um, to start up your policy server. Um, and your policy server, uh, in, in the config map, there is all there are all these policies that you have um, listed in the cluster admission policy. And um, hopefully you've configured them properly uh, because if you have, um, you know, your policy server will start up seamlessly. And once that's done, uh, it'll uh, spawn threads to actually evaluate incoming requests um, and also listen to incoming requests because you have to listen to stuff to actually start evaluating. So um, how does it listen to incoming requests? It's by starting up a HTTPS web server. But I also said um, that, you know, the Kubeborden policy server is an admission webhook endpoint and the Kubernetes API server needs to be made aware of this. And um, the Kubeborden controller is what makes it happen. How does it do that? We um, know that you know it creates a mutating or validating webhook endpoint. Uh, but how does it know the exact moment? Uh, when you know it has to create the mutating or validating end, end, 
uh, webhook endpoint. So within the policy server parts, there is a readiness group. And, um, you know, when its status changes to ready, uh, it's when, you know, uh, the endpoint is actually registered as a mutating or a validating uh, one. And once this plumbing is all generated, well, you're sorted because the Kubernetes API server then sends all the requests to the Kubewarden policy server. And based on the endpoint, uh, whether mutating or validating, your policy server actually ends up evaluating and uh, sends back the response. So uh, that's how it's done, folks. And uh, you can extrapolate this to uh, multiple policies, multiple policy server setup. Um, but where would you use it? Probably, uh, you know, in a mission critical setup where resiliency is key is one thing that comes to mind. And um, maybe in a multi-tenant setup uh, as well, where, you know, you require uh, um, a dedicated um, policy evaluation uh, handler for um, avoiding the noise that's generated from other tenants. You could possibly use that in that as well. So multiple policy servers, evaluating multiple policies is certainly doable. And uh, with that, we come to our next section, which is looking at why PS, uh, PSP, PSA um, uh, did not just cut it when it came to enforcing security in Kubernetes. Um, so to start off, um, we will first look at PSP, uh, which is Pod Security Policy, and it's removed currently in the latest version uh, and has been replaced by Pod Security Admission. So what is PSP exactly? Um, it's a framework to ensure that your pods are uh, running with proper privileges, able to access specified objects only, no unwanted access is um, given, and no extra access is given. In fact, the concept of least privilege is um, expected to have been enforced. And um, Kubernetes RBAC essentially links PSPs to users or services um, via uh, the roles that they actually assume. So let's quickly look at it in action. Now, I mentioned that uh, users or software or services are actually, uh, you know, given roles. Now, in a setup, you will probably have um, users and software um, assigned accounts or being part of accounts, which will then be, you know, bound to roles that have certain privileges. PSP actually um, checks uh, for, you know, the permissions assigned or corresponding to each of these privileges for each incoming requests and accordingly blocks or schedules the action. Um, but there is a problem, isn't there? Because it did get removed. So uh, what was the problem with S uh, PSP? Firstly, configuring it is extremely tedious. If you um, assign uh, you know, the broader permissive uh, privileges, you are going to land yourself into trouble. Um, and if you go to uh, go, go too restrictive, you uh, might have to, you know, uh, reconsider designing your policies, uh, designing your policies all over again, because certain pods might not get created and then, you know, they will be in the non reconciliate So the deployments or the higher objects will be non reconciliatory state. Um, and that is problematic because doing that for maybe one, two or three deployments makes sense. So um, it does make sense um, for a single installation, but it does not uh, when you know you have a huge, huge infrastructure to manage. So um, yeah, so PSPs were problematic and that's why we have the replacement in the form of pod security standards and pod security admission, which offer a more level-based control um, and um, you know, allow you to ensure that policies are set 
in a clear and consistent fashion. Um, so we're not going to go into the depths of actually, you know, checking uh, how it works. Uh, sorry about that, because we have a demo to get to. Um, but let's look at what's the problem with port security admission. Um, as a version to 1.25, um, it does not have any mutation capabilities. Um, so uh, that's one drawback. Another drawback is uh, higher level objects are actually evaluated only when audit or warn modes are enabled. So that's uh, essentially why tools like Cube Warden um, are important as supplementary uh, or can I say complementary? Uh, but uh, yeah, so they are, you know, empowering you as developers to integrate um, into your uh, cloud native infrastructure and enforce the level of granularity in the, uh, you know, levels that you want to enforce it in. Um, so we did create the project or conceptualize the project as replacing PSPs, but um, we, uh, we recommend doing it by complementing pod security uh, admission. That is by actually integrating Cube Warden into a pod security admission profile towards mitigating those limitations we just spoke of. And now we will just come to the demo part of it. And uh, hopefully you'll have a clear picture of how uh, you know this integration happens. So I'm just gonna quickly stop sharing this screen and start sharing my demo screen. Right. So just getting uh, the font size up to the mark here so that you all are able to see everything. Huh. So I have uh, downloaded all of these on my machines, but like I said in the initial slides, you are going to be able to download all of the uh, manifest that I am currently applying. So please don't worry that you know you're losing out on something. Um, now I'm going to share my screen all over again. Right. So let me walk you through what we are going to try doing. Okay. Uh, I say try because I am praying to the demo gods that it ho uh, that it all works out. So um, the very first thing that we are going to do is create a namespace uh, with extremely restrictive policies. Um, we're not going to allow pods to run as a root user, uh, which is, or, or rather uh, not run pods, but run the applications within pods as root users. That sounds reasonable. Um, but I am going to try to create a Hello World app that has run, uh, that needs to run as a root user um, by actually specifying it in the YAML. Now, uh, it will obviously not allow it because I have created a namespace that does not allow for it. Um, so what to do? Should I remove the root user? Uh, I don't think so. Can, you know, something uh, magically allow for a user to be created and assigned so that it can run the application as another user with specific permission levels. Let's see, because that's the demo. So um, first, first up, like I said, we are uh, going to create a namespace. Um, I will Okay, so we've created the namespace. Um, I've actually created it before, so I'm really sorry, but I will show you the lab YAML. So this is the namespace that I've created. Now, um, right, so now we will uh, first try to create uh, to run a Hello World app. Um, and uh, I'll show you the YAML here again as well, so that you are able to understand what I'm saying. So um, uh, you want to run as user zero, which basically corresponds to root. Uh, so um, these two actually conflict each other and then um, the pod's not created at all. Um, if I actually go ahead and apply this right now 
and create a deployment in my namespace, it shows that it's created. But let's have a quick look at how that's the case. Um, am I seeing any logs? Am I able to, just a second. Ah, oh, damn, sorry. Am I able to see any logs? Nope, not able to see any logs because it's just a simple Hello World application. It's not anything sophisticated. So just a second. Let's see uh, what's the status of the deployment because I'm sure that the status of the deployment is that it's not available. Uh, nothing's ready. Um, the replica set's not created, right? Um, we saw why that is the reason. And uh, now what I'm going to do is enforce this policy. So I should have named it better because I named it PSP, but it is PSA. Uh, so, um, um, so yeah, so basically what this does is um, allow um, the a uh, hello world application to get created if uh, even if it's uh, run as any and um, it does not have a uh, root user uh, specified so um, if if you just go ahead and check this so what i'm trying to uh, do is i do not have a root user specified here uh, if I actually um, ended up creating or applying this right now without the policy enabled, the pod would get created, but it would run into a container config error, which is not what we want. Um, so once uh, you enforce the policy and then apply this hello world application thingy without the root user, um, it will allow you to create so um yeah so that being said um let's just apply our create uh, not create sorry uh user psp policy this takes a while to actually get created so um um not created rather but to come into effect so if you just look at this it will be in pending status for at least a couple of minutes Like I said, it's in pending status. So hope, uh, hopefully when this comes into effect, you will be able to see that the pod does get created. Let's just see if this is active. Okay, still not active. Um, so once this gets active, I will be able to show you um, uh, the actual enforcement of the policy and the subsequent creation of the pod. Yes, now it's active, yay. Uh, so now I'm going to apply uh, the PSA cubewarden.yaml in mm. Now if I show you this So like I said, it's going to go into crash loop back off because it's just a simple message. Uh, but yeah, if you actually see, um, yeah, I, I actually forgot to delete the previous deployment. So let me redo it again um, instead of confusing y'all. Um, uh, yeah, so. Damn, sorry, that was two cube CTLs. Yeah, so I've deleted the app right now, but even then, if you apply, huh, you've created the hello world backup, it, it still ends up getting uh, into the, yeah, so see. So it goes into the uh, completed state and, um, yeah, so your replica sets are available. There is um, 
uh, your deployments will not be available because your pod has completed. So let's just uh, check the logs to see if everything's gone normal because logs are the best indication. In my space. So if you see, like I said, this is just a hello world application, nothing too fancy, but um, it does show that uh, you know this uh, um, this thing has started and completed successfully, which is why uh, the pod has come into complete completion status. Deployments are not available, and your replica sets created um, and are not ready because again completed. So uh, that's it for this demo. Um, I hope you understood a bit about how uh, we can integrate, um, you know, CubeWarden into a pod security admission profile. But to summarize, uh, what we essentially did is we created a restricted namespace um, wherein we did not allow any uh, application to run as root. We tried deploying um, an application to run as root via, uh, you know, uh, via the field run as user. Uh, we gave it as zero, even though um, just above that statement, we have given a sep uh, separate field wherein we are saying run as non-root user too. Um, now, when we did that, um, it still did not allow uh, the pod to get created. Um, or the deployment to come into available status. Um, and once uh, we applied the PSP policy, um, wherein we allowed um, a, for a port to get created if um, you know no user was specified. Now we could have done that in the earlier case. Uh, we could have actually just omitted uh, the run as user and um, it would have run into a config error because we have not actually specified the user. Um, we allow for that particular thing to happen uh, in this namespace by enforcing the user PSP policy. And then we create um, uh, a Hello World app or recreate it all over again by actually uh, first deleting the previous deployment and then by going ahead and um, you know creating a deployment wherein we do not specify which user we want to run as. So it allows for it to run. We saw from the logs and it gets completed. So um, after which um, you know the replica sets are uh, created, um, you know the deployments are um, you know created and the pod is created which was not the um, case in the very first um, YAML that we applied. So I hope that's a little bit more clear now how we do the integration. Now, coming back to our uh, presentation, because unfortunately we have to go back. Um, right, so we were here and now this was done. And now that we've looked at all of this uh, integration, let's check out some cool new features in version 1.3. So first up, this is something that we're all extremely proud of, um, that is joining the CLO Monitor Initiative, which is an initiative that checks um, for you know the healthiness of project repositories based on some conditions. Uh, it's a CNCF initiative. So we're currently rated um, uh, A with a score of 97%, which is pretty good. Um, and it's uh, we started off in the um, 90s, like lower 90s, but we currently, uh, you know, we currently have a score of 97%. So we've clearly gotten better with time, uh, if I can say that. Um, we've also listened to the community um, and uh, reduced the startup time for the policy server. So that's another major win in our bag, uh, according to us. And we've bettered our six store integration. Um, and that's all thanks to the fantastic work done by all members of the CubeWarden project um with respect to the six store um rust cube board in sdk 
uh so uh now you know we're able to handle um signatures produced by pkcs 11 tokens uh, which in plain speak is um you know uh nsm uh, not nsm sorry hsms and uh, smart cards um so that's a bit of the stuff that we've introduced and a little proud of but uh, we also have new policies because policy engine, right? And we want to simplify policy as code. So there are a bunch of new policies that are as always backward compatible, like most of our other policies, except one if I'm, you know, not mistaken. Uh, so we have um, one that's, uh, that's responsible for scanner and compliance of environment variables. We have the volume, uh, securing the volume bonds policy, and we have one that helps you keep up with uh, API deprecations as well. So yeah, so we have these four policies and uh, we have also expanded the scope uh, for some of the existing policies. Um, now, most of the policies were targeting pods um, earlier on. Uh, we have expanded the scope to include higher level objects like replica sets, daemon sets, jobs, cron jobs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, there are drawbacks with each of them, and you can use either or both. It's not like there is a strict um, you know, rule that you can't uh, you can't uh use one or you can't use the other. Uh, it's all upon your use case. But with this expansion of scope, what we wanted to do as a project was to give you the control as an administrator to actually get the level of granularity that you want. Um, because you should be able to do that, right? You should be allowed to actually um, uh, enforce um, the level of granularity that you deserve uh, customized to your infrastructure. So. That's what we hope to do with this uh, uh, expansion of scope. And uh, all theory, no talk is again, very boring. Um, so I'm going to go on to the second demo. And like I said, in the big uh, bef uh, demo before, I'll have to start sharing my uh, command line again. So I'm going to stop sharing this one. All right. So just a second. I'm going to open a fresh new window up for y'all. All right. Uh, hopefully, um, just a second. Yeah, this is great. So I'm hoping that you're able to see this. Now let me navigate to the second demos uh, manifest files. So... First off, I'm going to give you a summary and we're again going to summarize it at the end because that's that's how I work. So um, first up, what we're going to do is, um, yeah, so just let me open up the files. So, so we're going to look at the environment uh, variable compliance policy with this demo. That's first thing. Um, and what this essentially does is, that um, we are uh, going to actually um, enforce that uh, if a resource is created with any of these uh, environment variables, you actually um, uh, do not allow for the pod to be created. Uh, you'll get an er error message with uh, something that's very similar. So um, saying something very similar to what I just said, but that's that's the objective. Um, once we see that, we will also uh, try to create something. We'll edit this resource one.yaml in, um, uh, in line, and uh, we will then try to actually create something that is um, partially fulfilling, like, some of it doesn't fulfill and some of it does. And we are going to try doing that um, in this one. So that's uh, so we'll try to see if the environment policies can actually, uh, sorry, the environment variables can actually comply to the policy. 
So uh, first up, um, we do not have any preconceived notions here. So I'm going to first just apply uh, minimum required for uh, the environment variable policy here with this file. So this is created, takes a little while. So So while we're doing that, let me just also right. So so we are going to see um the other one. So I just want to show um, um, how these look in VS Code so that it's a little more visible. So what we are essentially, let me just share my screen again. Uh, what we are essentially going to try to do is that we are going to create So this is the resource that we are going to try to create, right? So we are going to try to have an engine, uh, nginx deployment uh, with uh, the environment variable foo bar. Now um, we uh, have explicitly told uh, in our policy or specified in our policy that we do not want this to be created, right? So um, this should essentially block this cre the this creation or the creation of this resource. So coming back to our command line, let's see if the policy has now gotten active. Yep, now it's active. Um, so kubectl apply f. Oh, okay, sorry, 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 sorry about that. I misspelled. I'm just gonna clear this out one second. So if you see the error message here, the resource cannot define any of the environment variables from the rule. So yeah, the policy worked. But now we want to edit the policy uh, a slight bit. Okay, uh, now we're going to try creating a resource firstly, which does not comply to this. All right, so let me just uh, switch the share to our um, VS code. Can edit it here, but I'd rather do it on VS Code. So here uh, in the minimum require um, um, wars.yaml, we've specified these. So I'm now just going to have a uh, environment variable named foo3 with value bar. It's just very simple and it's easier to remember. And now we will uh, go back to the command line. Uh, I'll just actually just share my entire screen because this, the switching is getting a little too tedious for me. So if I actually apply resource.yaml now and press enter, the Nginx deployment was created. Yay. So that means the policy works, right? Um, we have several fields within the policy uh, that you can use. Um, any in is one. Um, uh, there are several other fields. We've actually um, written a whole blog post about it that you can find on our website, uh, cubewarden.io. So um, we've actually seen that uh, you can uh, enforce or at least scan for the compliance and enforce the compliance of environment variables 
with this policy. So that is what this demo was all about. And now we are going to go back to our presentation, which is on its last leg. So um, I'm going to leave you with these resources, uh, to be honest. Uh, we um, uh, These are some of the uh, website docs uh, that I really found helpful while preparing for this presentation. And I think you would too if you had to read or uh, have it for any reference. Um, the Cube Warden website is here. There's also the Artifact Hub where we publish all our uh, policies. And uh, we have um, the official cra uh, create documentation, which provides more details about the Cube Warden SDK uh, for Rust. Um, then we have the Tiny Go, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tiny Go uh, project um, website that I've linked here because we use their compiler for Go. Um, the different policy project templates and also the GitHub issue for built-in functions. I did not forget that. So, uh, yeah, just a second. So, oh, okay. I Just a second. I'm really sorry about that. So, yeah, that's pretty much all I had. Um, and, yeah, this is the Swift policy template if you all wanted to see that. But uh, that's pretty much all I had uh, for today. And I also wanted to uh, give a huge shout out um, um, to where you can find us because um, uh, this, this conversation should not stop here. So uh, if you want to chat with us, you can find us on the Kubernetes Slack on the Cube Warden channel. Um, we're also there on Twitter um, for as long as it's up. And uh, we're there on YouTube too. Uh, in the uh, Rancher YouTube, on the Rancher YouTube channel, we uh, we frequently make appearances there as well. And that's it. Thank you um, once again. And uh, if you missed the supporting material uh, that I actually linked to in the first couple of slides, here's that again. Um, I hope you made a note of it. And yeah, that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening in today. And I hope you reach out to us and let us know if there are any uh, things we can help you with. Thank you.